So uh, tonight we're looking at Islamic art. Last week we looked at, uh, a week, two weeks ago, Christian art. And Islamic art fits a number of forms, from agriculture, to decorative arts. So we're going to start with architecture and its most profound expression, the mosque. The word mosque entered the English language from the French word mosquée, meaning site of prostration, as in prayer, as in prayer, and hence a place of worship. Any act of worship that follows the Islamic rules of prayer can create a mosque. You want to see the most simple mosque in the world? It's a nomad's mosque. It's the nomad's mosque. Now, you're going to be able to compare that with some of the things I show you tonight. Uh, so most mosques of any significant size, uh, and especially the grand mosques, or the Friday mosques, as they're called, they're called Friday mosques because that's where, on Friday, you have everyone come together for congregational prayer. So if you're in a, if you're in a city, you'll have a number of mosques, but if you can get to the Grand Mosque on Friday, that's where you will go, because you'll be there with thousands and thousands of other people, as, as I'll show you in a moment. So most, uh, most uh, mosques have a, a specific uh, orientation and element, and you can see it in this diagram. So I'll just go through this, the major parts of the diagram. Do you see the minaret? Mm -hmm. yeah. That's from which the call to prayer are issued. Traditionally, a muazin would go up there and call the locals to prayer. How many times a day? Five, Five and they would come. Um, today, it'll be done with a loudspeaker. If you've ever been in a, a Muslim city, <laughs> those five times a day, you will hear it, include, oh, yeah. including 4 a.m. Um, so there's that. Then there's the courtyard and prayer hall. Do you see where the courtyard is? The prayer hall is where people will go in to pray, but when it's really a lot of people there, they overflow out into the courtyard. So you can get, uh, for example, at the mosque in, in Delhi, 200,000 people. Yeah, I'll show you a picture of that. Um, then there's uh, an ornamental niche called the mirab, N-I-H-R-A-B. Can you see that up there? That's set into the wall, and I'll be showing you some as we go along. This is just a diagram. You're going to get some good pictures. Um, it indicates the direction of Mecca. Whenever a Muslim prays, they pray in the direction of Mecca. I think I might have told you that in the hotel room that I was in, there was on the, on the desk, there was a little sign that in, uh, when I was in um, uh, Tunisia, which pointed towards Mecca. So if you're traveling and you need to pray, you know where Mecca is. Okay? Um, and in addition, there'll be what are called ablution facilities. An ablution is when you cleanse yourself, generally with water, but it can also be with sand. Um, and you do that before you enter the mosque. It's an act of purity. Most religions have something similar. You know, you, you, water purifies you. Uh, and there will be separate sections for men and women. Okay, mosques have a separate section for men and women. So according to scholars, the oldest mosques in the world that still exist in form are this one called the Mosque of the Companions, which is in Eritrea. You can go home and look up where Eritrea is. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not going to tell you because I don't have a map here, but it's, it, it's in Africa. So that's a hint. It's not in Australia. Okay. And then there's the Kuba Mosque in Medina. They're both from the 7th century. They're both from the 7th century. And Medina is the town about 200 miles north of Mecca, where Muhammad took his hijra when he led the community, and that's where he established most of the, of the laws of, of, of Islam. Um, so these are considered the two oldest in, in the world. Um, historically, mosques were important centers not only for worship, but of education, 
even today, the big mosques will have their educational wing for elementary and advanced training in Islamic theology, etc. They're really the center of the community, just like the cathedrals or churches used to be the center of the community in Europe. What's, what are the centers of our community? Shopping malls. <laughs> yeah, right, they are. Shopping mall. That might tell you something about relative spirituality. I don't know. I don't know. Yep, yep. 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 So, the most sacred mosque in the Islamic world is, I don't have a picture of it. It's the great mosque in Mecca. I think we've seen that one before. So that's why I didn't include it. That's where people go on the Hajj when they make pilgrimage. That's the most sacred. Um, but there are a number of other mosques, grand mosques around the world, which I want to show you some pictures of. Uh, the Prophet's Mosque, which is in Medina, and I'll get to that. The Great Mosque of Isfahan, which is in Iran. The uh, Jama Masjid, which is in Delhi, India. The Hassan II Mosque in Casablanca, Morocco. And the Istiqlal Mosque in Jakarta, Indonesia. So let's start with the Prophet's Mosque, one of the largest mosques in the world. It's the second holiest site for Sunnis after the great mosque of Mecca, because Muhammad spent much of his lifetime in Medina. In fact, he's buried in this mosque. Uh, it was originally a small house that was next to, it was apparently built by Muhammad next to his house. Uh, and it served as sort of a community center, a court, and a religious school. But Islam, like most religions, started very small. You know, a few, a few followers, then expanded. It's, it, how many did Christianity start with? Twelve, okay? So, like Islam. So, when we talk about the early mosques, they were just maybe the size of this room. Those are all minarets, yes. Uh, I don't know the order that they use them, but uh, yeah. And, 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 and it's also a part, decorative part of a mosque. It's a, there's the functional part, but it's, it's the decorative part. Because, well, it's been, re, it's been remodeled a number of times, but it dates all the way back to the time of Muhammad, but it was originally about this size. But r successive rulers built and added on. Um, and the, the minaret is also sort of like a, the spire in cathedral, because it's pointing, it's pointing upward, and where you call the prayer is from up. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So um, um, one of its main features is what is known as its green dome. Green is generally associated with the color of Islam. Uh, people ask why. No one knows for sure. Some suggestions are that Muhammad's favorite color was green. <laughs> which makes a lot of sense. Another one was when you think of the desert, and you, the green is the oasis. Yeah, so you, yeah, and so Islam becomes sort of the oasis for the soul, if you want to put it, put it that way, for, for a Muslim. Um, uh, the space beneath the dome was the house of Aisha, one of Muhammad's favorite wives. Muhammad had seven wives. Um, most of those were more for political reasons than anything else. He was married early, I don't want to go into all the history, to Khadija before he became the prophet. And he had one wife until she died. And then, if you know anything about how tribal societies work, marriage generally has a lot more to do with political connections than lust. <laughs> so when you say, Muhammad had seven wives, well, he, he, was, he was putting factions together, partly. But anyway, this was his favorite wife, Aisha. There's the interior. Do I have to explain to the audience what's so funny? <laughs> Here's the mirab and the minbar. 
So the mirab, you see it on the left, it's the indentation, it points towards Mecca. The minbar is uh, the platform where the imam for the mosque will give his sermon. So on a Friday, that's where he would be up in front of all the believers giving his sermon. And they can become quite political. They, ha they have been. Some of the, uh, uh, during, especially let's say during the uh, Iraq war, the, the, the Iraqi mosques, the, when they were when up there on Friday, they weren't just talking about um, spiritual things. They were talking about the political situation. Political yep. And it also contains Muhammad's tomb, the resting place of Muhammad. Interestingly enough, do you remember the Wahhabis? The Wahhabis are the very conservative puritanical wing of Islam that is prevalent in Saudi Arabia. They got rid of Muhammad's house in Medina because they didn't want it to be a place of worship. Because for a Wahhabi, you don't worship the prophet. You only worship Allah. And any idea that you'd be worshiping the prophet would be seen as blasphemy. Some wanted to get rid of this tomb. But tradition was powerful enough to keep it, keep it, keep it going. Do they actually know he's in there? Well, <laughs> he's, he was buried somewhere. And it was, it's said that he was buried there. That's a hard thing to prove for anybody, isn't it? When I go out to the cemetery and I look at that name, how do I know they're buried in there? <laughs> tradition, anyway. It's often it's what you believe is more important than what actually is. So, okay. So we now want to move to our next mosque. This is the uh, oldest mosque in Iran. Uh, it's in uh, where did I say it was? It's in Isfahan. Isfahan yeah. Um, it's uh, and Isfahan is known as the city of mosques. This is only one of about seven or eight of this this immensity and style. Um, so we only have the time to visit this one. It's known as the Masjid e Jame, uh, and it's been the result of continual construction, reconstruction. It starts at about the eighth century, but it's been reconstructed a number of times. Even up to the twentieth century, they've been making uh, additions. It's built on what is known as the Four Iwan style. Um, and what's an Iwan? That's an Iwan. It's a rectangular hall or space, usually vaulted, and walled on three sides with one end entirely open. So if we back up, there are four of those in each direction. There are four of these major Iwans. Um, Is that Lapis? Uh, I think so. Yeah. What city is this? This is in Isfahan, Iran. Isfahan. Yeah, if you, if you ever go to Iran, <laughs> go to Isfahan if you like mosques, if you like mosques. Um, so the formal gateway to the Iran is usually decorated with bands of calligraphy. We're going to see a lot of calligraphy in a moment, glazed work and geometric designs. During the 13th century, the Qibla Iwan on the southern side of the mosque was vaulted with niche-like structures known as mukarnas. Yeah, it's like a honeycomb. Here's the prayer hall. And one of the most well-known features is its elaborately carved stucco mirab, commissioned in 1310. That's the mirab is, which points towards Mecca. It was by a Mongol ruler. The Mongols were Muslim. It's located in a side prayer hall built within the Western Arcade. Has that ever deteriorated? Yeah, it's they've all. Because the 
They, yeah, a stucco, yeah. They, they've been constantly uh, reconditioned. And this is the inner dome. Okay, we now go to New Delhi. Actually, Old Delhi. It was, originally it was Delhi. <laughs> That's all there was, was Delhi. Then the British, when they came in, set up in a part of the city which they called New Delhi. But the, the, uh, the Jama Masjid, uh, uh, which means world reflecting mosque, is in Old Delhi. Um, it's a Friday mosque. This is where people would come from throughout the city on Friday for prayers. It was built by the Mughal emperor. Well, there's another view of it with its domes and minarets. There's the minaret. It was built by the Mughal emperor Shah Jahan. Does anyone know what else Shah Jahan built? The Taj Mahal. He was a great builder. So he built all sorts of, uh, uh, he built mosques, he built shrines, uh, he built all sorts of things throughout northern India. I have the reflection pool. Yeah, there'll be a reflection pool generally. Yeah. Yep. Mm -hmm. The minarets uh, re recede from several balconies. Uh, and you can see that this one is made of red sandstone and white marble. And in the old days, yeah, people would, there's steps in there, and they would, yeah, they, inside, and you would go up, and that's where the uh, Muzadin would call you to prayer. There you go. That's a Friday prayer session. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it, uh, all the pardon me. Oh, this is the men. There'll be a men's section and a women's section. Yes. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. There's the prayer hall. I don't know if you can tell, but can you tell that in the prayer hall? Some of the tiles look like prayer mats. When Muslims pray, they pray on a prayer mat. So the, the design there is sort of like a, um, a, a prayer mat, which is kind of neat. There's the dome. All these mosques have beautiful domes from the interior when you go in and you look What's up. That What's that? What's it constructed of? The, the dome. It'd be stone with, uh, with um, then various, not jewels, but uh, various things added on. Yeah, I'm, I'm not an artist. Uh, I'm not a, I should ask somebody who knows. <laughs> yeah. How they don't decorate any of this with pictures in the, no. It's just all design. Design, yeah. And, uh, uh, our next section is going to be dealing with geometric art. Because when you think of Islamic art, it's geometric or calligraphic. Um, it's very high. It's higher than this ceiling. Oh, yeah. It's, uh, yeah, three, four stories high. Yeah, it's, it's immense. I mean, well, if you go back, you can see the dome. Oh, yeah, it's five or six stories. Five or six stories, yeah. And you see there's more than one dome. And it, interesting, this mosque claims to have some relics, just like um, certain Christian cathedrals do. Uh, this mosque claims to have beard hair of Muhammad. <laughs> no, it's a little, and that's the sort of thing that uh, conservative Muslims don't like at all, because it's, it's making uh, a, a, a sort of a fetish of a, a relic, and people shouldn't be relic, worshiping relics, they should be worshiping Allah. 
Okay, now we move to Casablanca, Morocco, and the Hassan Second Mosque, which Chris fell in love with when we were there last time. Second largest mosque in Africa and the seventh largest in the world. Its minaret is the world's second tallest at 689 feet. And it's topped by a laser, a light from which is directed towards Mecca. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You have variety, different, different cultures will put their own architectural uh, elements in here. But the laser is very recent. Oh, the laser, yeah. This mosque is very recent. It was only built in, I have the date here, uh, in the late, I think, 1980. So it's, oh. it's, it's a new mosque. Um, so it stands on a promontory to the Atlantic Ocean. The walls are handcrafted marble and the roof is retractable. This king wanted a mosque for people to remember. And if you're king of Morocco, you have the funds. <laughs> uh, a maximum of 100,000 worshipers can gather together for prayer 25,000 inside, 80,000 outside. So in 1980, during his birthday celebration, this is King Hassan II, proclaimed he wanted to create a single landmark monument in Casablanca, stating, I wish Casablanca to be endowed with a large, fine building of which it can be proud until the end of time. I want to build this mosque on the water because God's throne is on the water. Therefore, the faithful who go there to pray, to praise the creator on firm soil, can contemplate God's sky and ocean. Work commenced July 12, 1986, it was conducted over a seven-year period. From what we were told, he wanted, that's quick to build a mosque like this. They worked around the clock. They had work shifts, so there was never a stoppage of work. So one group would work eight hours, another group would work eight hours, another group. So it was completed in, in seven years. Um, the building's dimensions are 600 feet in length, 330 feet in width. You would think it'd have a real problem with the soil there. They did a lot of work. They did a lot of work. Uh, uh, foundation. Yeah, foundation. The foundations really go deep down. Yeah, because of ocean too. Mm -hmm. Oh, wow. This is what's amazing about geometric art. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's so fine, and you do, it takes your breath away. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I was always impressed that the geometric shapes are not always repeated. Everyone may be different, and yet they don't look as if it's mismatched. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. <laughs> There's the prayer hall. You could put St. Peter's inside of it. <laughs> What's that? <laughs> yeah, it's a retractable roof. Which, yeah. Can you see the roof up there, the wooden? I, I think I have a better. Like I said, it's a retractable ceiling. Uh, the wood comes from cedar from the Atlas Mountains. If the Atlas Mountains were the source of that last big earthquake in, in, in Morocco. It contains glass chandeliers. Where do you think they come from? Murano, Italy. This guy wasn't <laughs> Cost was not an issue. <laughs> Cost was not an issue. So our final mosque is in Jakarta, Indonesia. This is again, is a, you can see, a sort of modern mosque. Uh, it's known as the Istiqlal Mosque, the largest mosque in Southeast Asia, world's third largest Sunni mosque, 
uh, in terms of capacity, 120,000. After the 1949 Indonesian National Revolution, there was a desire to build a national mosque for the new republic, which had the largest, mo largest Muslim population in the world. A lot of people don't realize Indonesia has the largest Muslim population in the world. What's that? Uh, this is in Jakarta, so I, yeah, I don't know the, the, um, if you look at the number of Muslims in the Middle East, compared to the Muslims in Indonesia, India, minuscule. We think of Islam as the Middle East because that was its origin. But like I said, the largest uh, uh, Muslim world, country in the world is Indonesia. Uh, the foundation stone was laid August 24th, 1961. It took 17 years to build. Uh, it was opened February 22nd, 1978. The building consists, as you can see, of two connected rectangular structures. The main structure, that's the larger structure, and the smaller secondary structure. Uh, the smaller one serves uh, as prayer spaces. So the big one is, is the main mosque. Um, it has seven entrances, and all seven gates are named from the 99 names of God. In Islam, there's something called the 99 names of God. These are the 99 attributes of Allah. Love, compassion, justice, there's 99 of them. But uh, it has seven gates, that's because, remember, I think we, we have that somewhere else. The seven gates represent the seven paradises in, his, in the Quran. The seven paradises, or the seven heavens. The main dome, uh, is adorned with a stainless steel ornamental pinnacle in the form of a crescent moon and a star. Can you see those? Those are the major symbols of Islam, the star and the crescent moon. The main floor and the four levels of balconies make five floors in all. The number five represents the five pillars of Islam, which are the five things one has to do to be a, a Muslim. And we've gone over those before, I think, right? Declaration of faith, alms, fasting, daily prayer, pilgrimage. There's the prayer hall on a Monday morning. <laughs> There's the prayer hall on a Friday. Yeah. Bill, yeah. do they have like lines or something for people to like, know where to put their prayer mats down and stuff? Is there always a straight line? Straight line. Uh, do you mean do they have actual lines on the floor? Uh -huh. I doubt it. But they know how to line up. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so that's, that's the main architectural uh, form in Islam, the mosque. And the, I've only shown you seven or eight there. But you could do a whole course on, on the, the great mosques of the world, the great mosques of Iran, in, in any case. So now let's move to uh, decorative art. Uh, typically characterized, as someone said, by the absence of animal and human form. Uh, and an extensive use of calligraphy, geometric, and abstract floral patterns. These have been expressed on the walls of mosques and other buildings and manuscripts and on carpets. The absence of figures, especially human, stems from the prohibition of idolatry and the belief that creation of living forms is God's prerogative. Uh, exceptions are found in what might be termed secular painting, as found in Persian miniatures, if you've ever seen, we'll look at some of those down the line, and paintings from the Mughal Empire, and we'll return to those shortly. So let's begin with calligraphy. Islamic calligraphy is the artistic practice of handwriting 
in the languages which use the Arabic script or alphabet. So these would include not only Arabic, but Persian, Urdu, Ottoman Turk. So the, but it uses the, um, the, uh, uh, the, that script, okay, the letters. Yeah. What might it say? Hmm? What would it be saying, the script? If you can read, well, see, see uh, you see in the, on the one on the right, it, there's, there's, there's the f f one to five things pointing up, and then there's one that goes like this and that. That letter is the huh. So those are all letters, but they're, but they're fancified. It becomes an artistic expression. Think if you tried to write something in English, but you didn't just, you, you fancified all the letters. You could even curl them around. And, and the more fan, yeah, yeah, in manuscripts. The more fancified you get, the harder it is for the average person to read. Yeah, it does. Yeah. It does. That's what it does say. It's, it's the Bismillah, which means God is most great. Um, if I were to buy a card, a greeting card, and it had something on the front like that, mm -hmm. would I be blessed to send it to someone other than a Muslim? I don't think so. So that, no. that isn't considered... No, that, no, that's, this is an artistic expression. Yeah. You wouldn't want to buy something with a picture of Muhammad on it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you, okay. So, uh, this is what we call calligraphy. Uh, in the oldest, there are various, over time, a number of different scripts have evolved. This is the oldest. It's called the Kufic script. And it was inscribed on textiles, coins, and buildings. And generally, you'll find it in terms of printing the Quran. That's a page of the Quran in Kufic script. It's called Kufic script, strangely enough, because it comes from Kufa, which is in Iraq. Can the truth of the No. I don't think so. No. Yeah, you'd have to know calligraphy pretty well to be able to read that. And this is ancient Kufic, so that would be very difficult to read. Yeah. It's also found on coins. So after the coming of Islam to Iran in the seventh century, the Persians adapted the Arabic alphabet and they began to develop their own uh, calligraphy. In the 10th century, a guy by the name of Ibn Mukia and his brother created six genres of Iranian calligraphy. So six different forms of, this is an, to be a calligrapher is a lifelong project. It's, if that's, it's a life, if, if you're gonna be a calligrapher, that's what you, study, that's what you do, uh, and that's what you practice. Uh, and this was one of its earlier forms, known as the Naqsh form, it comes out of Iran. The uh, root of the Arabic term means to copy, which refers to the fact that it replaced the old Kufic script in copying the Quran. It introduced a number of modifications, resulting in smaller size and therefore greater delicacy. Isn't that much more delicate than, than that? Then in the 14th century, we had what was known as nastalik, which gets even fancier. Uh, Unlike, the, unlike its ancestors, it started to follow the natural curves, which made it more beautiful, but harder to read. Like well, this, it, interestingly enough, some of the heretical groups would use calligraphy 
in their writing a lot of their, their own passages and even letters to one another because the government couldn't make it out. And of course, they would, they would have their own modifications of it, yeah. Well, in China, they're just about to be very Yeah. Yep, yep. You, language, if you control language, you control culture. We often don't think of that. You control the language, you control the culture. Um, and then it got even fancier. And again, most of these are not, for, these are for artistic purposes. It became a, a, a major field of artistic expression. And then some of some got a little bit creative, maybe stretch the rules a bit. These are called uh, calligrams, where you use uh, written words in Arabic from Allah, Muhammad, and Bismillah, and you produce anthropomorphic figures out of them. <laughs> you just twist the the writing into a specific form. Uh, sort of, you know, <laughs> you're not supposed to have form, but that's calligraphy. Uh, okay. um, so, over the centuries, calligraphy has been an essential element of mosque art, appearing both on walls and domes. Blue is one. Yes, blue is one of the the, the, the co favorite colors of artists. It was also used in uh, the illumination of manuscripts, especially the Quran. The, the, there's two pages of the Quran in illumination. Now, speaking of the Quran, this is, I found this really fascinating. We saw a few, a few of these when we were in the, uh, um, uh, the big uh, Museum of Islamic Art in Paris. Miniature Qurans. One inch in length, three-fourths in width, a half inch thick, the entire Quran written out. You need, you need a magnifying glass to read it. But these became uh, uh, art, uh, a form of art, a form of art. Many versions date back to, they became very popular during the Ottoman Empire, 15th, 16th century, and also in Iran. Okay. So let's move to some ornamentation. The designs in Islamic art are often built on a combination of repeated geometric forms, which may be overlapped, interlaced, to form intricate and complex patterns. The four basic shapes, or what are known as the repeat units, are circles and interlaced circles, one, Squares and four-sided polygons, two. Star patterns and multi-sided polygons. Those are the four basic uh, patterns which are then uh, put together in various forms. Um, and they occur in a variety of Islamic art forms. The earliest grand Islamic buildings, like the Dome of the Rock, which is the shrine on, on, on the Temple Mount in Jerusalem, had tile facades and interior walls decorated with mos tile mosaics with geometric patterns. From the ninth century onwards, the distinctive Islamic tradition of glazed Brightly colored tiling 
for interior and exterior walls of domes developed. That's so they were often tiled. That's what I, that was the word looking for. So mosque wall decoration with these geometric patterns. So a well-known form of tile work known as zelish originated in Morocco. It's a style of mosaic tile work, as you can see here, made from individually hand-chiseled tile pieces. And then we saw them working on those in one of the workshops there. The pieces are different colors fitted together to form various patterns. Most notably, elaborate Islamic geometric motifs, such as radiating stars. From the 14th century onwards, Zalish became a standard decorative element along lower walls, fountains, pools, minarets, and floors. It's found in many of the modern buildings, such as the Hassan Second Mosque that, we've saw, that we saw, the use of that zalij. Mm -hmm. Uh, another pattern of tiled work known as jiri, which is, means Persian knot, uh, consists of angled lines that form an interlaced strap work pattern. And there were whole books of these different patterns that were, that were, that were made. And this was all before computers. <laughs> yeah. And all, yeah, all hand done. This is known as the uh, Toptaki scroll patterns that came out of Turkey. They developed a whole book of different patterns that artists could then turn to to use. There were 114 different patterns. These are patterns that artists thought were worthwhile. <laughs> you can develop your own pattern, but I mean, it's sort of in any art, you know, there are the masters, and if you want to challenge the masters, you can, but you better have a masterpiece. <laughs> so, yeah, these were the traditional forms, and then people would take these forms and develop them, develop them. Um, They've been used uh, to decorate various materials, including stone screens, for example, at Fatapur Sikri in India. Fatapur Sikri is, is uh, just outside of Agra. This was a capital that uh, one of the great Mughal empires built and then had to abandon because they couldn't get water. But you can visit it there. All the buildings are there, but it, they just couldn't, couldn't get water there. But these screens were often women with, in this, the women's section, so they could see through the screens. And here's one at the Sultan Hassan Mosque in Casablanca. Another form of decorative expression found in Islamic art is arabesque. Uh, it's a form of surface decoration based on rhythmic and repetitive linear patterns of scrolling and interlacing foliage tendrils. Can you see those? Another definition is foliate ornament, typically using leaves derived from stylized half palmettes, as they're known. 
which are then combined with spiraling stems. It usually consists of a single design which can be seam, uh, seamlessly repeated as many times as desired. We find it as far back as the great mosque, 8th century mosque of Damascus. Can you, can you see it? The use of arabesque, the, the foliage patterns. And it's based on this flower. The acanthus flower. Yeah, that's, that's sort of the basic model that was used to the, for arabesque of this plant, this flower. You can see it here in, in this facade of the famous Mishata facade from the 12th century. It's a little harder to see because it's not colored. But if you look closely, you can see the arabesque. This was uh, a residential palace in Jordan. There's a whole series of what are known the, the desert palaces of Jordan, if you ever get to Jordan. Uh, they're really quite, quite amazing. Uh, but it's also, it was used not just for grand art, but just wall decoration, practical art. Uh, geometric floral patterns occur in a variety of other forms, including carpets, ceramics, and glasswork. No Islamic, uh, no artistic product has become better known, especially in the West, than the Persian carpet. And here we see three examples. Chris might notice on the right. What's that one, honey? That's ours. <laughs> yeah, that's, um, that's a carpet that comes from Shiraz. It's known as a um, Naim. A lot of the Persian carpets you see will use reds. And the Naims only use blue and, uh, and beige and, uh, and white. But carpets are not restricted to, to just uh, to Iran. Uh, they... People who just sit on it barely. She's had the whole collection. Did she? Uh, So you find Turkish carpets, Indian carpets, Moroccan carpets, beautiful carpets, beautiful carpets. They are expensive. They are expensive. If they're, yeah, yeah. We don't we don't walk on ours too much. Yeah. Our walkway is to the left. Yeah, but we did, we did buy a runner. You can buy rather than a, a runner, which we do walk on, which is yeah, in the hallway. Yeah. They built the Mercedes Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Don't let your dog get on it. <laughs> okay. Um, ceramics. Uh, wonderful achievement. Uh, in fact, sometimes when you refer to Islamic art, one of the first that'll come up is ceramics. Uh, in the absence of wall paintings, you don't find a lot of wall paintings, so ceramics were taken to, to uh, almost an unmatched height compared to other cultures. Um, the first industrial complex for pottery was in Syria in the 8th century. Uh, and uh, over time, moved to Iran, to Turkey. And interestingly enough, it was often influenced by the Chinese. Because the Mongols were Muslims, but they came from China. <laughs> they originated in China. So uh, you find a lot of Chinese influence in, in, in uh, Islamic pottery. Can you see the dragon? In, yeah, there's a dragon in there. So let's look at just some examples. Is that 
It's a uh, slab, pottery slab, to, to put on a table, for example. Well, glasswork is also became one of the. Well, the one on the right kind of looks like Art Nouveau. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I. I'm not sure if I have the dates on these. Um, I think these are as far back as 13th century, though. What's that? Cloisonne. Cloisonne? Uh, yeah, I think it was used in Iran, but I don't know if it's solely Iranian. I, I'm, not, I'm not an art historian, but so I, a lot of these things I really don't know. I just, I just uh, adore looking at this stuff. <laughs> they also had stained glass. Okay, so I mentioned painting, and generally you don't, you don't associate Islam with painting, but um, you do find what is known as the Persian miniature. If, uh, if, if anyone has had any contact with Islamic painting, it's most likely the Persian miniature. It's a small painting on paper. I should have brought some of ours. They're very small. They're usually about this size. They're not big. Um, uh, they can be used as a book illustration or a separate work of art, intended to be kept in an album. That, that tells you something, right? In relationship to ex displaying the human form, if you're keeping it in an album, that's a little different. It's a little different. No, the, it's a, you can spin things, you know, you can <laughs> find ways of getting around something. Yeah, what was your, your, your father used to tell me? He said, Moses came down from the mountain with 10 commandments. Then the lawyers got a hold of it. <laughs> so you can always find, you can find some way of getting around something. Okay. Yeah. So this is the Persian miniature. Uh, came significant during the 13th century and became paramount in the 15th and 16th centuries. Um, like I said, they were mainly kept in books. So if you had your miniature album, that's where you would keep them. You didn't usually put them out on a wall. Um, the other reason, perhaps, that they were allowed is that they're very small. <laughs> you, know, you, you had to look pretty close to, to see the facial features of any of these figures. They often became part of manuscript uh, illumination. Sometimes an entire page, sometimes two pages. Buildings were often shown in what is known as a complex view. You, get, you see what it, why it's a complex view? You see both the interior and the exterior in, in, the, same, in the same painting. So two, I'll just give you two of the most famous uh, miniature artists. One was known as Kamal Eddin Bezad. He was uh, the head of the royal workshop of artists in Tabriz, Iran, during the late 15th and early 16th centuries. He was an orphan, raised by another prominent painter who taught him to paint. And his major patrons were the uh, sultans of Tabriz and Herat. He painted for the aristocracy. He died in 1535, and his tomb is in Herat, along with his statue. His two most famous works, 
One, the seduction of Yosef. And this is one of my favorites, Ad advice of a Sufi. A Sufi is a mystic. The other famous artist was Reza Abbasi, born in Mashhad, Iran. His father was, a, was an artist, and he worked in the workshop of the governor. He received his training from his father, and finally he joined the workshop of Shah Abbas I. Shah Abbas was the Persian Shah, the king of kings. So he worked at the highest levels. Uh, unlike most earlier Persian artists, he signed his work. Often they weren't signed, but he signed his work. Um, he accompanied the Shah on a number of campaigns. And then interestingly, when he got back, he had what some have called a midlife crisis. <laughs> he wanted greater independence from just painting for the, for the, for the Shah and Shah. And he got very interested in what was known as Isfahan's low life, low life including wrestlers and other disrespectable types, which I'll use your imagination to create. But in 1610, he returned to the court, <laughs> continued to in the employ of the Shah until he died. His specialty was the single miniature for albums. So uh, wealthy people would hire him to make uh, one of these miniatures uh, generally uh, to keep in their albums. Uh, his favorite figures were idealized, stylishly dressed, beautiful young men and women. Isn't that gorgeous? Okay, we're almost finished here. Final uh, Islamic-inspired uh, art form, which needs to be mentioned, is the garden. The garden. Especially the Persian garden. Mm. The tradition and style of garden design represented by Persian gardens emerged in the Achaemenid dynasty, 500 to 300 BCE, long before Islam was known as the Paradise Garden. It influenced the design of gardens from Spain to India to Camarillo, probably. <laughs> you can probably, if you look hard enough, you'll probably find someone who's probably put up a Persian-type garden. Its purpose was, and is, to provide a place for protected relaxation in a variety of spiritual manners. It's a place of spiritual relaxation, to be in beauty. The common Iranian word for enclosed space is paradisa. Paradisa, a term that was adopted by Christian mythology to describe the Garden of Eden as paradise on earth. There are various forms of Persian gardens. The most, one of the classic forms is known as the char bag diagram. Char means four, bag means garden. So you can see four separate gardens divided by usually a waterway and a pool. It can be a walkway, but there usually be water involved. Um, like I said, it means four gardens. Uh, and it comes from the Quran. The verse, it says, and for him who stands before his Lord are two gardens, and beside them are two other gardens. So the idea of four gardens. So we'll just finish up here by taking a look at kind of th three different examples. You think you could relax in there? I think I could. <laughs> yeah. 
Okay, that brings us uh, to an end of the Islamic uh, art session.